Stanford University. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Caroline and Elizabeth um, for these wonderful kind words, and uh, Mailing Gonzalez for organizing me and making sure I got here, and uh, everybody for coming along. And I hope you're enjoying all the events so far. Uh, I think the, these events, they're really good things. I just spent an hour with a student who came with me 15 years ago, when I first started excavating in Sicily, we've kept in touch ever since. Really good guy. He's back for his 15th class reunion. But so, well, okay, so I, I'm going to talk to you um, about a, 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 a complicated and touchy subject, like the evolution of human values. And um, this it sort of uh, goes back to um, my archaeological work, I was mentioned just a moment ago. Um, Exactly one third of a century ago, 33 years and four months ago, I went for the first time in my career, I went to, to dig as a graduate student, to excavate on a site in Greece. Here, here you see the artist as a young man. Uh, when I look back, back in those days, I have not changed a bit. So I went, I went to a little town, a little village, an agricultural village in the north of Greece, a place called Asiros, um, where we were excavating a site there. And um, our, our days would consist, you know, you go and you you'd dig on the site, and then we'd come back to the dig house, and we'd work on what we'd been finding and cataloging things and keeping the records and so on. And then we'd sit out in the, the dusty front yard of the dig house and you know, have a couple of drinks as the sun went down. Uh, one evening, pretty early on in the project, one evening, we're sitting there having our drink and down the road in front of the dig house comes this little old guy um, on the back of a donkey, tapping the donkey with his stick. And next to him is this little old woman bent over double under the weight of this huge bulging sack on her back, and we're watching them come down the road, and this is not them. These are pictures I found on, on the internet. <laughs> the, the guy on the right is actually, if you can see at the bottom, it says, discover Lebanon, so this is clearly not him. And the woman on the left is actually a Swiss peasant, but this is like a, a mood shot, get, get you in the, in the mood. So there we are, we're watching, watching this couple come down the dusty road, and they come right up to the dead house. And one member of the team, whose Greek was pretty good, he, he stops them, and they, they talk for a minute, and, and the little happy party troops on down the road. And so we ask our buddy, um, What's going on? What was that about? And he says, oh, that was, that was Mr. George and, and, and Mrs. George. Um, and they, we said, well, okay, so what did you say? He said, well, I asked them, how are they doing? And they're doing well. And I said, yes, and? And he said, well, then I asked them, why, why, is, why is your wife not on a donkey? And Mr. George just said, well, she doesn't have one. <laughs> and, and, yeah, we, we, we all thought this is a remarkable answer. I mean, where, where I came from, you know, a guy who rode his donkey while his wife carried you know, all the village possessions on her back, you would not think well of a guy like this. And yet, clearly, Mr. George, he's not a social outcast. He's an important man in the village. People think perfectly highly of him. Now, this was... Um, Really, my first experience of the, the classic anthropological thing of culture shock. You go somewhere else, and people just do things differently. And um, a couple of years ago, I was invited out to Princeton University to do the, the Tanner Lectures in Human Values there. And I ended up, the, these lectures became really my attempt to explain what I'd seen that day in the little village of Aceros 33 years before. Actually, just a little, little promotional thing here that the fine people at Princeton Press like me to show you all. I wrote this book. This is a book based on these lectures. Now, what, I realize, what I'm trying to do here, I, I was trying to make sense of and explain wildly different ideas about fairness. So I mean, to, to us on the Dig Project, it seemed very unfair that Mr. George is on the donkey and Mrs. George is staggering under the weight of this huge sack. To Mr. George, and as far as we can make out Mrs. George as well, this seemed absolutely fair and right and proper. So I, this got me thinking about fairness. and I, Where do ideas of fairness come from? And the big problem, the big difficulty I was having, there were Two, there's two big theories out there about the evolution of values and ideas about things like fairness. And one of them um, comes from the, the evolutionary psychology side, where there's been a, a series of famous experiments. Here's a group of pictures related to one of them. A, a, a researcher, a woman named Sarah Brosnan, did this at the Yerkes uh, Primate Research Center down in Atlanta. And she did something, uh, primatologists have shown this a lot in the past, so this was not that surprising. Um, she was able to show, like, if you give one of these monkeys um, one of these granite pebbles, you can train the capuchin monkey to give the pebble back to you. And you reward the monkey for doing it. So you give the monkey who gives the pebble back, you give them a little slice of green pepper they get here. And happy monkey got a green pepper, gave the pebble back. Happy researcher. Well, Dr. Brosnan came up with a little wrinkle in this experiment. She said, every time the monkey gives me back the pebble, the monkey gets a little piece of green pepper. Except that randomly, one monkey every so often will get a cherry tomato. 
And wow, that is so much better than a piece of green pepper. And it's totally random. And so like, monkey A gives you the pebble, gets the pepper. Monkey B gives you the pebble, gets the cherry tomato. Monkey A looks at monkey B and says, wait a minute, what's going on here? We did the same job, he's got the tomato, I got this crappy piece of pepper. What's going on here? And some monkeys kind of look at the pepper and shrug and eat the pepper, say, hey, you know, life is unfair. Others look at the, the pepper and say, I'm not playing this game anymore. They, they sulked, they refused to participate in the experiment. Some monkeys looked at the pepper, looked at Sarah Brosnan and threw the pepper in her face. They became violently angry. This is not fair. She said, this is the conclusion she reached. This is what the monkeys are saying. Conclusion she reached. Um, values, uh, moral values, are evolutionary adaptations, evolved adaptations to the world. And each species of animal has evolved its own set of monkey values or chimpanzee values or whatever. And they evolve these values because the, the more um, the monkey has sort of genetically hardwired into it, the values that work best in monkey society, the more likely that monkey is to succeed in passing its genes on to the next generation. And so this is an evolutionary built-in effect to produce monkey values, human values, chimpanzee values. It's all driven by our genes. However, there's another school of thought, uh, and this is dominated much more by philosophers and cultural anthropologists. They will say, so you can do something like, say if you were to go to northern Tanzania, get to northern Tanzania, um, in some parts of northern Tanzania, you'll find a group of people called the Hadza, or hunter-gatherers, um, living you know, mobile foragers. And if you ask a Hadza guy, um, about fairness, you ask somebody that has about fairness, Hadza will tell you it's perfectly fair that men and women should be equally free to pursue their lives and have whatever sexual partners they want, perfectly fair that men and women are the same in this regard. But it'd be perfectly, totally unfair if one person had a lot more property, a lot more goods than somebody else, that would be unacceptable. 50 miles down the road, you visit the Nyamwezi farmers, here you see a Nyamwezi farmstead, Ask a Nyamwezi person about this. They will say it is absolutely not fair that men and women should have the same freedom to pursue sexual partners. Absolutely not. Women must remain loyal, faithful spouses. Men, eh, that's a different story. But it is quite fair that some people are richer than others. If you're a good farmer, you should be rewarded. You should be richer. Now, the conclusion that a lot of humanists draw from this is that values are culturally specific. Variation is the big thing. The two very, very different theories here. And so the, the question I was thinking about was really was sort of, well, which is right? Which explains things better? And the conclusion I came to, I, I, the usual conclusion, I think, in academia, is it's a little bit of both. And both of these things have got something to say to us. And I think a lot of it, it's a matter of perspective. And I mean, what I do, the kind of work I do in archaeological, long-term history, I felt that if you look at the entire world, across the last 20,000 years, as a back away from the details, taking the big picture, you start to understand what's going on. And so this book I wrote then was a study of the evolution of values on this sort of scale, trying to understand why people have got the sort of values that we have. And so and I focused on particular kinds of values, otherwise you know, the book would go on forever, but um, limited really to ideas about fairness and saying, well, ideas about what people think is fair in terms of, say, political equality, economic wealth equality, gender equality, then also, um, I think, uh, something which I found very useful to add into the mix, ideas about violence. What do people think is a sort of just and proper use of violence? Um, and so this is what I was trying, trying to figure out. How can, on the one hand, our values be hardwired into us as the animals we are, as human beings, and yet how can they also vary so much? And the conclusion I came to, cut straight to the chase, is that there's huge variety out there. The anthropologists are quite right. But despite the variety, there's actually a fairly simple pattern it comes right down to. The evolutionists are also right. And I think it comes down really to just three big patterns of values, which you see um, in this, this chart here. There's no quizzes, but I'm afraid there are charts in this. And um, I got, what we've got, we've got along the top, we've got three different kinds of ways of organizing societies. Foragers, who are hunter-gatherers, people who live off wild plant and animal resources. Farmers, so well, we, we all know what farmers are. People who live off domesticated plants and animals. And then people who live in fossil fuel societies, where we augment wild and domesticated um, sources of energy with the energy that's been trapped, sort of sunlight that's been trapped in fossilized plants, so because we then dig up in the form of coal and oil and gas and use to power other things. 
And it seemed to me there's some systematic patterns in attitudes about fairness and justice in these three different ways. I mean, this is like the whole of human history is incorporated into this. This is all the ways that there are out there of doing things. And in terms of political inequality, I mean, foragers overwhelmingly say it's bad. Farmers tend to say it's, it's sort of good. Um, you, you have to have people in charge. Fossil fuel people, we again, on the whole, in modern fossil fuel societies like the one we live in, we tend to say it's bad. Democracy is the right way to do things. Gender inequality, the foragers, they, they're not saying it's totally bad and shouldn't happen. They say there should be some gender inequality, but not, not very much. Farming societies, people tend to say, yes, of course men and women are different. And men, I mean, over 99.9% .9 of the time, men are superior, men are more important. Fossil fuel societies, we tend to say gender inequality is bad. Wealth inequality, foragers get bad, absolutely bad. Farmers, no, it's right, you're a good farmer, you should prosper. Fossil fuel societies, I think we have a rather ambivalent attitude about wealth inequality. And then finally, attitudes about violence. The foragers tend to say, ah, you know, there's a time and a place for violence. There's problems that can legitimately be solved by violence. Farmers tend to be less, less okay with violence. Um, they restrict the scope much more. And in fossil fuel societies, we tend to be overwhelmingly against violence. If you think there are problems you can solve with violence, people tend to frown on you um, quite strongly. We, in fact, we put you in jail, uh, the best way of frowning on people. And, and basically, it's like the, the foragers are saying, people are all the same, you should treat them all the same. The farmers are saying, everybody's different, you should treat everybody differently. And the fossil fuel people, I think we've gone back a lot to saying that people are sort of all the same. Now, of course, like I say, this is the whole of human history in a, a, a thing with 12 cells in it. So slightly broad brush stroke, lots of exceptions, lots of variation, many qualifications. But I think, um, I think the, the patterns do hold up tolerably well against the evidence. But where, for me, where it gets interesting is, um, you know, this is sort of my summary of the attitudes people have. And to a great extent, it seems to me that the attitudes, the evaluations people have about fairness sort of match up quite well to the realities of the sorts of worlds that people live in as foragers or farmers or, or fossil fuel folk. And um, just one example of this, just uh, uh, the wealth inequality thing. So it's something I can show uh, a simple chart of. Um, yeah, the foragers tend to say it's bad. The farmers tend to say, yes, of course, wealth equality is fine. Inequality is fine. Fossil fuelers, a little bit in the middle, tend, tend to be increasingly down on wealth inequality. This, this is a graph um, talking about wealth inequality. And what it is, it's got the three categories on the bottom, foragers, farmers. Oh, actually, four, I lied, four categories. Foragers, farmers, and two different versions of fossil fuel people um, pre, before taxes have been applied to income and after taxes have been applied to income. And what we're looking at on the vertical scale here, this is a measure of inequality that economists like very much. It's called the Gini coefficient. And what it does, it measures the inequality in a society on the scale from one. Uh, 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 one would mean um, you have perfect inequality. So like we pool all the income of all the people in this room and give it all to me. <laughs> Uh, we, we do that, and uh, the, the, well, the Gini coefficient will then be 1.0. One person's got everything, everybody else has nothing. Of course, you can't have a society with a Gini of 1.0 because you all die. If one person's got everything, everybody else is dead. Um, the other end of the spectrum is zero. That means we pool all the wealth and divide it absolutely equally between us. So uh, there's no wealth inequality at all. And what you see, this is a fairly recent study of levels of wealth inequality in these different kinds of groups. Foragers, the average score in a foraging society is down around 0.25. Um, it leaps up, almost doubles, 0.48 the average in farming societies. Then the fossil fuel societies, um, before taxes and other kinds of redistribution get done, um, they tend to have a Gini score lower than the farmers, but closer to farmers than to foragers. After the taxes, it's closer to foragers than to farmers. We push it down. We, we are trying to use government to even out inequality and smooth out income differences. And on the whole, foragers say, Wealth inequality is bad. They live in a world where there isn't much of it. Farmers say, on the whole, it's pretty good. They live in a world where there's a lot of it. We tend to be a bit ambivalent. We live somewhere between the two. And this, this got me thinking. Um, perhaps the, the sense of what's right and wrong basically is just driven by the way the world you live in works. That whatever kinds of distributions um, function best and tend to sort of win out in the struggle of the world, those are the ones that people start saying, yeah, this is, this is right and proper. This is the way the world should be. 
Now, if that's right, because that then raises this next question, well, why? why? Why would things work like this? Why would foragers and farmers and fossil fuel folk have such different attitudes? I mean, does eating wild foods make you feel egalitarian? I, I don't know. <laughs> I suspect the answer is no. I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Is it that foragers, hunter-gatherers are nice and farmers are nasty. Is that, yeah, they're just, by nature, bullies or saints. Is that the answer? And actually, I mean, these of us say this picture, the Russian peasants, he looks like a bully. I mean, if you had to find a picture of a bully, that's him. Um, but clear, again, this, this is not very likely. Um, that it's a simply a matter of your personality. For some reason, all the foragers have nice personalities. Is it a matter of evidence? The kind of evidence we've got about different, the different kinds of societies varies wildly. But again, it's really hard to see that the evidence is producing these different sorts of patterns of values. And the conclusion I came to is that what is really driving the, the ideas about fairness and justice along is the way people get energy from the world around them, which might, might sound a bit peculiar when I put it that way. But what I mean is that when you're a hunter-gatherer living off wild plants uh, and animals, a farmer living off domesticated ones, a fossil fuel industrialized person living off your know, oil and gas and these other things, the different energy sources um, reward different kinds of organizations of your society. And it seemed to me that the different ways of organizing your society reward different kinds of sets of values. And that this is what's driving it all along. And people's interpretation of an idea like fairness tends to get driven by this set of things, the organization of their society, ultimately the way we're getting energy from the world around us. So let me try to explain um, what I mean when I say that stuff. Um, if you are a hunter-gatherer, forager, you're living off wild plants, wild animals, it's difficult to capture much energy from the world. I, I wrote an entire book quantifying how much energy people capture from the world. If you're having trouble sleeping, this is the answer. I mean, confidently say it's the dullest book ever written, but I, I think quite useful. And so, uh, um, foragers, on average, foragers capture five to 10,000 kilo, kilocalories of energy per person per day. And you need something, a minimum of about 2,000 to keep body and soul together. Foragers don't get much energy. It's difficult to get much energy from wild sources. And the, the main challenge, the main problem for foragers is how to get by on this small amount of energy that they, they're able to capture, um, which they do in very, very ingenious ways. Uh, and one of the consequences of the small amounts of energy they capture is they live in very small, highly mobile societies, very little organization, and um, because there's very little organization, violence is often a, an effective way to solve problems in their societies. Now, farmers, um, oh, oh, sorry, oh yeah, right, and if you live in one of these um, foraging societies, it's very difficult to accumulate much wealth in the first place. The amount of energy flowing through the system is so small. And if you do accumulate it, it's really, really difficult to maintain it. It's like, what are you gonna do? Like, you're gonna build a house while you're a forager, you're moving base every few weeks. Why would you build a house? It's sort of pointless. It's very difficult to maintain any kind of hierarchy, although people do try, but it's just very, very difficult in a foraging society. Now, farmers capture a lot more energy from their domesticated sources of energy they've got. Here's just a little graph. Say, foraging, five to 10,000 um, kilocalories of energy per day. Farming, a vary between about 10 and 35,000. So you're quite a big range. So they're capturing a lot more energy. They can do a lot more stuff with it. The biggest question for farmers, the biggest challenge they face is that as you go from being a forager to a farmer, your society, you've just got to do much more complicated things. You've got to get people to work together to do things. Your cities get bigger and bigger. Um, stuff has to be done. You've got to do stuff. You've got to like, build ships. To, these are all Roman examples, actually. Uh, build ships to move food around as populations get bigger and bigger. You've got fields to fertilize. You can build aqueducts like they did in Tunisia, marching across the desert mile after mile. They flock together. The number of people grows and grows and grows. This is a, a model that Mussolini had made of the ancient city of Rome. It's still on display. Rome had probably a million people living there in the first century BC. You see the scale, because of the amount of energy in the system, the scale just grows and grows. Now, th this creates what, what social scientists call coordination problems. How do you get all the people to work together to, to make these things happen? 
And farming societies have tried just about every technique you can imagine. But the one that increasingly they all sort of converge our move toward was increasing use of forced labor. Not a very nice solution, but a sort of top-down solution. And this is the most effective way to generate the, the labor force you need to do the things a farming society has to do. Um, in farming worlds, it becomes much easier for a few people to accumulate a lot of hierarchical advantages, political, economic, you name it. Here's a guy, this is a guy who had a lot of hierarchical advantages, King Tut. King Tut not only was buried in a giant suit of gold, King Tut was not just rich. He, King Tut was not just godlike, King Tut was a god. That was the official position of the Egyptian state, he is a god. Now that is hierarchy. But on the other hand, farming societies tend to be much less violent than hunter-gatherer societies because you can't do all this stuff if people are solving too many of their problems by fighting each other. They put a lot of pressure on people not to fight. Fossil fuel societies. The amount of energy we extract just dwarfs anything that's happened before. Say so 35,000 up to about 230,000 kilocalories per day. Here are the foragers, here are the farmers, there's us. And us, here at Stanford, we are way at the absolute peak. It's Americans who burn through 230,000 kilocalories of energy per person per day. Vast amounts of energy at our disposal because of the fossil fuels we've got. We can burn up and create energy, do whatever we want, power machines. And the big question in fossil fuel societies has always been, and fossil fuel society is only about 200 years old, very recent invention. The big question has always been, well, how do we organize all this production and consumption, all this stuff we've got? Um, and there's been a great debate, how do we organize this? And the most effective outcome uh, seems at this point to have been to create societies where you've got prosperous consumers um, making enough wealth to be able to buy all the goods and services you can now produce, which can generate even more wealth, and we all get richer and richer and richer. Um, to have societies like that, you've got to have extremely high levels of organization, uh, very, very little tolerance for violence, because you can't run a place like Stanford University if everybody is solving their problems by whacking each other in the head. I mean, you ask me a difficult question, I run at you with my cell phone and start pounding on you. I mean, this is just a really bad idea, and we're not going to stand for that kind of thing at all. So, um, how does this work? I mean, if this is right, how, how exactly does this work? Well, it seems to me, looking at the historical record, the way it works, the way you get these sort of clusters of solutions within these different kinds of societies, is through a process like constant experimenting, people trying out different things. Some things work better than others. Um, the solutions that work best, if the more your society goes toward what you might call kind of equilibrium, the solutions that work best, the more it's likely to succeed in the endless competitions you're always waging against other societies. Like say if you, you come up with a, a bad answer, say you're a forager band uh, living in the Kalahari Desert, and one of you decides that you should run this band like it's the court of Louis XIV, and you're all going to go around in powdered wigs, issuing orders and commanding everybody around. This is not going to work well. You're going to die of hunger remarkably quickly. Now, on the other hand, if you try to run 17th century France like it's a forager band, this is not going to work either. This is going to fall to pieces very quickly. The Prussians will come across the border and shoot you all. Um, as constant competitions going on, the more people organize themselves in the ways that work best in the foraging or farming or fossil fuel worlds, the more successful they tend to be. And we've got lots of evidence um, of these competitions working out. This is one of many pictures I could show you of a site, an archaeological site from the borderland between farming communities and foraging communities. The farmers relentlessly expanded through prehistory drove foraging societies almost completely extinct by the year 1500. Um, in modern times, you know, fossil fuel societies dramatically expanded during the 20th century, pushed farming societies close to the, the verge of extinction. And within fossil fuel societies, two, in some ways you can think of the wars of the 20th century as struggles over two competing models of how you organize a fossil fuel society. A very centralized, top-down model where you have five-year plans and all this kind of thing, and a very bottom-up model. This is the New York Stock Exchange in 1963. A very bottom-up model where you open it up as much as possible um, to, to let people figure out for themselves uh, how you do things. Now, there are all sorts of fascinating uh, 
exceptions and the borderline cases. And you know, we talk about the whole of human history here. I don't have time to talk about all of these, but of course the solution to that problem is you buy my book uh, and read it all the way through. Um, I'll cut straight to the conclusion, which I think you'll be grateful for. Um, basically, it seems to me, although this is um, not, not everybody thinks this is a very nice conclusion to reach, it seems to me, while you know, clearly you can have too much inequality in a society, uh, pretty much everybody would agree on that, you can also have too little inequality in a society. Society. And this is something I think the historical record is quite clear on. Each age has a kind of right level of income inequality um, for it. And the, the, judging by the way these things turned out, it seems to me this is where the ranges are in terms of this Gini coefficient and the income inequalities. So foraging sort of around 0.25, farming societies up around 0.35. Fossil fuel societies around 0.30. Our societies work best when we have more inequality than the foragers, but less than the farmers. And al although that's a sort of politically incorrect suggestion, it seems to me that actually pretty much everybody agrees. And I think you just look at the recent history of our own societies to see this. Back in the 1970s, when the world's rich countries were driving income inequality down and down and down, many of the OECD countries, income inequalities down here below 0.25, in the 1970s, um, there are enormous economic failures, enormous economic problems in the rich countries, unemployment soaring. Voters in country after country choose to elect people like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, who tell them to their faces, we are going to increase income inequality. We're going to make the rich richer, but we'll make the poor richer too. But the rich are a lot richer. We're going to do this. And we vote for them, and we vote for them again, and we keep voting for them as often as we possibly can. People seem to have concluded there was too little inequality. It wasn't working. However, since about the year 2000, more and more of the rich countries are up around here, having chosen Thatcher and Reagan and their like. They did what they said. They pushed the income inequality up. We're now at the very top end of this range in many countries. Voters are leaning toward very, very, you know, a whole different set of economic problems. Voters leading leaning toward a very different set of politicians. You know, characters like Bill de Blasio in New York City. Um, in Britain, the Labour Party just put Jeremy Corbyn, a very left-wing guy in charge there. Even worse, <laughs> even scarier possibilities seem to be out there of people <laughs> who some voters like very... My uncle, like my wife's uncle Bob, thinks he is fantastic. Um, well, okay, let me, let me sort of wrap it. Where are we for time? Yes, I should be sort of um, moving this toward a conclusion at this point. So I want to make a couple of wrap-up conclusions about this. I mean, I'm suggesting that um, different kinds of societies, depending on you know, how, the, how we extract energy from the world, that drives what sort of organizations work most effectively, and that drives what kind of values are going to flourish most, and that drives what people think ideas like fairness mean. Now, if that's right, I think there's a, a couple of wrap-up observations that I think are pretty interesting anyway. Um, one of the observations is that, on the whole, I think it's fair to say that the, the liberal approach to how fossil fuel society should work, this decisively won the struggle of the 20th century against the totalitarian views of how a fossil fuel society should work best. Um, the, the, uh, the democracies defeated um, the fascists and the communists fairly decisively. Now, one of the big questions in international relations um, uh, theories at the moment is what is going to happen to China in the 21st century? As China becomes richer and richer during this fossil fuel economy, um, is China going to liberalize like the richest countries in the world? Or, in fact, will the richest countries in the world start to look more like China? as China is so successful on the economic front, will people start to say, well, you know, one-party state, well, it's got something to be said for that. It seems to work. The trains run on time. They crash a lot, but the trains run on time. Maybe that's the way we should go. And this is one of these big debates. And this actually came up in uh, the last time I was in China. I got into a, a big discussion. Uh, there's me at the bottom, looking a little older than I was in that early picture I showed you. And up here is a guy, uh, Thomas Piketty, an economist, who's actually speaking here at Stanford tomorrow, 3.30 in Memorial Auditorium. And we got into this big discussion there about, basically about this issue. We were in Beijing, and this is what a lot of the Chinese economists there wanted to talk about. What will happen to China in the 21st century? Well, it seems to me the, the obvious implication of this long-term history of ideas about fairness and how, how they work is that um, you seem to need an open society to flourish in a fossil fuel world. There's all this energy. This is, has been, so far, has clearly been the most effective way to use all the energy available to societies. 
if China wants to carry on getting richer and richer and becoming a bigger and bigger player in the world, it must liberalise its institutions. And you look at the recent history of East Asia. This is, of course, this is exactly what did happen in Japan and South Korea um, and Taiwan, Singapore, to some extent in Malaysia and Indonesia as well. All of them. Um, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, all of these are pretty nasty one-party states. Now, to varying degrees, they are all democratic. Um, this is the way East Asian societies have gone and felt they, they had to go. And my suspicion is that this is what Xi Jinping is wrestling with at the moment. Why, why there's so much trauma uh, going on in China at the moment. Seems to me, other things being equal, this is the way China must go if it wants to continue seeing this economic growth. However, I said other things being equal. One of the things that being a historian teaches you is that other things are never, in fact, equal. And so a prediction like that it raises more questions than it actually answers. And the, the, the latest phase, I would say, in the struggle over the best way to organize the fossil fuel societies like the one we live in, a lot of it's been driven by these linked revolutions that are going on in genetics, nanotechnology, robotics, computing. A lot of them, of course, going on right here around Stanford as we speak there, generating the next stage of it just 100 yards away from here. These are driving a lot of the big debates about how, how should society be organized? What should fairness look like? We're transforming the world faster than ever before. And part of this transformation is transforming uh, the, the sources of our energy. Uh, these new, uh, new supercomputing powers consume staggering quantities of electricity. I mean, you, we now have individual supercomputers that consume more electricity than there was in the world 100 years ago. Extraordinary energy demands. Now, there's much argument over where this is going. And I had the good fortune a couple of years ago to sit in on some Silicon Valley meetings organized by the National Intelligence Council, which is a, a branch of the CIA. Their job is to forecast where the country is going. And they are very interested in how technological changes are going to impact the security environment of the 21st century. So we got talking about a lot of these things and some very interesting conversations. I did want to wrap up by <clears throat> excuse me, talking about one, one topic that came up a lot in our discussions, and um, this I th think is going to be almost my last graph. I should apologize for graphs in classes without quizzes, it's a little unfair, but um, they're, they're sometimes quite handy. Uh, this is a graph, if you're a sort of techie, geeky person, you, you might well be familiar with this. This is a graph drawn by Ray Kurzweil, who's a <clears throat> director of engineering uh, over at Google and done all kinds of other things as well. And what it is, it's Kurzweil's illustration of a very famous idea um, called Moore's Law. The idea that the power and the power of computers will double on a predictable, regular, exponential basis. The expense of computing will halve on the same kind of basis. Kurzweil said to himself, well, what if we draw a graph from 1990 um, on forward into the future, assuming that the rates, uh, the, that um, the power of supercomputers will continue doubling on a 1.2 year basis, which is what it's been doing. On the vertical axis, you've got a scale of, the, uh, of whatever that means um, on the vertical <laughs> axis. Like, like how, how, how cool and, and geeky they are, I guess it means. Now, what Kurzweil, and Kurzweil, he's an interesting guy. I don't know if you've read many of his books. He's a, he's a weird and interesting guy. And um, he talked about two things, Kurzweil. He said, well, one of the things that's changing, according to Moore's law, doubling in power at the moment, is the, the power of scanners, brain scanners our ability to scan the human brain. Now, um, Kurzweil pointed out that if the power of brain scanners continues increasing uh, at the current rates, then by about the year 2013, we'll be in a position to do a basic neuron by neuron scan of somebody's brain. Now, what that means is, I mean, you, you, you who you are, your personality, your memories, everything about you is it's a system of electrical signals flashing back and forth, trillions every second between the neurons in your brain. That's who you are. That's what gives you your memories and your personality. Um, the brain scan guys are saying, we will soon be in a position to produce a neuron by neuron scan of your brain, an exact copy of your brain. Now, at roughly the same time, says Kurzweil, if the supercomputers carry on doubling in power, We'll be in a position where you could upload one of these scans of your brain onto a supercomputer. Um, and at that point, what does that mean? Well, philosophers argue a lot about what that might mean. Kurzweil says what that means is now we've got two of you. 
One of you is the nasty, sloppy, wet, carbon-based version sitting in this room, decaying before my very eyes. <laughs> the other is a pristine, I was going to say silicon-based, it won't be, it'll some, be some uh, quantum computing thing, but a crisp, pristine computer-based version that will never decay. There will now be two of you. By 2025, says Kurzweil, we'll be at a point where um, we'll not only be able to sort of model this on the computer, we'll be able to actually do it, actually upload the second version of you and have it working in real time. Now we've got two of you to deal with. By 2045, if the trends continue, we will be in a position to scan the brains of every human being on the planet, upload all of them to a single giant database in the sky and merge them into a giant thinking machine with intelligence trillions of times greater than all the people in the world today combined. Now, some people say, uh, no, we won't, uh, is, is a, the, the obvious response to this. But um, Kurzweil's predictions, they are more, he drew this in 2005, they are more or less on schedule. In uh, January 2014, one month behind schedule, a supercomputer in uh, Kobe in Japan ran a simulation of a human brain. Now, they didn't do it in real time. They actually reproduced the activity of 1% of a human brain, and it took it 40 minutes to do what a brain does in one second. So kind of early stages yet. But Kurzweil, of course, jumping for joy, saying, we are going in exactly this direction. Now, the reason I bring all this up, what is it going to mean for arguments about what is fair, what is equal, what is just, when we have all been beamed up to the great database in the sky? Will fairness mean anything? Will justice mean anything at that point, if something like that happens? Um, perhaps with my, my diagram I started off with, we will, we'll need to add a fourth column, a fourth post-fossil fuel column here over on the right-hand side. And perhaps it'll say, I mean, not just okay, bad, good for these different sorts of inequality. Maybe I'll just say irrelevant. It doesn't matter anymore if the boundaries between individual humans begin to break down. Even if we go nowhere near as far as Kurzweil, um, the boundaries between individual humans are beginning to break down. So maybe what it means is that uh, our fossil fuel morality, it's going to change just as abruptly as these earlier versions of morality have changed. A hundred years from now, the sort of ways we look at the world are just going to seem completely irrelevant. So maybe that's what will happen. We'll get a post-fossil fuel column. Unless, of course, it doesn't happen. What, what if some people, unlike the Kurzweil vision, what if some people upload their brains faster than others? You know, the, the governor, former governor of our state of California, <laughs> uh, has brain been uploaded in a, a rather alarming way. Um, and this is you know, beloved of science fiction writers, that some people get to be superhuman. Um, some people have the thinking power trillions of times greater than the rest of us, and some don't. What happens to ideas about fairness and justice then? And there's a famous story that um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the, the, the novelist, was once supposed to have been at a party and trying to be clever at the party like writers always are. And so he says this line, you know, the rich are different from us. To which Ernest Hemingway, according to the story, just happens to be at the same party, and says, yes, they're richer, um, and which everybody thought was terribly funny. Um, this vision of the future implies a world where the rich really are different from us. Um, the rich have become a different kind of animal. The, the fourth column on this diagram, it doesn't just say irrelevant down there on the kinds of inequality. It says really, really good. Um, some people go to a point where they have transcended humanity altogether while others don't. So, where does that leave us? Well, one thing I think we can make a genuinely confident prediction about is that by the end of the 21st century, the values of fossil fuel democratic societies like the, the ones we live in, they might look as outdated as the sort of values that I saw with Mr. and Mrs. George a third of a century ago. So I will stop there, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.